Here she is. The reason there's a market for Mr. Waste Systems and the reason you are watching these videos. And she's not going anywhere. Mosquitoes have probably existed for about 100 million years. And over that period, they've evolved to be very good at what they do, which is to perpetuate their species. And yes, we know this mosquito is a female because only the females suck blood. And she has to have a blood meal to produce eggs. So to her, we're just a step in the life cycle. To us, she's the enemy. And it's a good idea to spend a few minutes getting acquainted with her and her habits before we jump into discussions about the equipment and designing an effective misting system. In this video, we'll cover two topics. First, we'll review the biology and life cycle of mosquitoes. Understanding the life cycle gives us important insight about when in their lives they can be controlled and how. And we'll discuss that in the next video. Second, we'll talk about why mosquitoes really suck. There are about 3,000 different species of mosquitoes that have been identified around the world. Not all the species are blood suckers, but many are. Obviously, they are the ones we care about. And since we're most familiar with mosquitoes when they are adults, we'll begin our discussion of the life cycle with that phase. And like a lot of the life cycle descriptions, this one begins with a sex scene. Males and females are mature enough to mate when they are about two days old. And though it sounds impossible, by detecting the unique whining sound of wing beats, males are able to locate females of the same species and hook up. Depending on the species, this sometimes happens in swarms so thick that it might be mistaken for smoke. After a minute of passion, the males fly away to suck plant nectar with the chance to mate again in the one week they'll live. The female stores his sperm in her body and dispenses it as she needs to fertilize all the eggs she will ever lay. At this point, she just needs one more ingredient to do that successfully. Blood. So she goes hunting. Upon by the most enormous mosquito I had ever seen. I let him have it with my handy spray gun. It didn't work. I tried my rifle against the brute. But the bullets just bounced off him. There was nothing to do but run for it. He drove his stinger right through the cabin wall. And while she'll settle for just about any warm-blooded host, humans are among her favorite targets, since we're slow and don't have protective fur or feathers. Although there are some exceptions, most mosquito species are active and feed in the hours around dawn and dusk. During the heat of the day, she finds a cool, protected place to rest. To find a host, she has highly tuned sensors that enable her to detect carbon dioxide and lactic acid exhaled by mammals or compounds found in their sweat. She also has sensors in her eyes that detect motion. To feed, she is equipped with what is called a proboscis, essentially a highly adapted hypodermic needle in a retractable sheath. She will alight so softly that you may not notice her, and she'll begin to probe your skin with her proboscis. With each insertion, she'll inject an anticoagulant from her salivary tube that keeps your blood from clotting. It's your body's reaction to that chemical that causes her bite to swell and itch. When she nicks a vein or artery and tastes blood, she'll hold very still and suck up to two to three times her body weight, assuming you haven't noticed yet. After she finishes and is heavy with blood, she'll struggle to become airborne. She'll land on the nearest vertical surface and begin digesting the blood. Depending on the temperature, it takes two to three days for digestion and for the eggs inside her to develop. After that, she goes looking for a suitable place to deposit her eggs. So what does she think is suitable? Well, it depends on her instinct as determined by her species. If she's a permanent pool breeder, she'll look for filthy standing water which won't contain predators like fish that might devour her babies. Good candidates are things like a sewage lagoon or an abandoned swimming pool. But if she is a temporary pool breeder, she'll lay her eggs in an empty container or junk tire or damp soil at the water line where they lay dormant until they are flooded by a rain. Here she instinctively expects that her eggs will eventually be surrounded by nutrient-laden water. Again, depending on her species, she'll either extrude her eggs and stack them into what are referred to as rafts, like this one, or she'll lay them one egg at a time. 
The raft will contain about 240 eggs and resemble a half grain of rice floating in still water. When she's finished, she flies away and begins looking for another blood host. And unless she comes to an untimely end, she will repeat the feeding, egg-laying process for the two weeks or so she has left. It only takes a couple of days for the eggs to incubate and then grayish white larvae burst from their shells. They hang head down in the surface film with tails that are equipped with a breathing tube to take in air at the surface. If the water is turbulent and there is no surface film, the larva can't breathe. That's why mama looks for standing water. The larvae spend most of their time feeding on algae, bacteria, and other microbes. And that's why she looks for nasty, nutrition-filled water. The larvae move in jerks and dive below the surface when disturbed and are often referred to as wrigglers. They are large enough to be visible on close inspection. Over a period of a week to two weeks, depending on the species, the larvae will go through four stages shedding their skin each time before they morph into a pupa. The pupa appears to be totally different from the larva. In the course of an hour, the pupa's skin hardens and its body curves into the shape of a comma. It rises to the surface to breathe through what are called respiratory trumpets. The pupa are extremely sensitive to nearby movement and will flip their tails and tumble if disturbed. This is a non-feeding stage of the life cycle and it only lasts for a couple of days. Then, the most amazing phase of development happens. The pupa stretches its length under the water's surface and its covering splits open. Slowly, the new adult mosquito emerges, head, thorax, then wings, body, and legs. It pulls itself up and walks gently on the water. After about a half hour, her skin hardens and wings dry and she flies away to a place protected from wind, rain, and sunlight where she can rest in complete development. In a couple of days, she'll look for a mate and repeat the process we've just discussed. In the next video in the series, we're going to take what we just learned about the life cycle and discuss the implications for mosquito control. But before we close out this one, a word about why mosquitoes really suck. For most of us, though we may hate them with passion, mosquitoes are only a nuisance, sucking our blood and leaving us with welts that itch. They are such a nuisance that some people are willing to take extraordinary measures, like buying a mistaway system, so they can enjoy their backyard without thinking about them. But that's not the reason mosquitoes suck. In many parts of the world, they leave behind more than a welt. According to the World Health Organization, there are more than one million deaths a year that are attributable to diseases carried by mosquitoes. The majority of these deaths are due to malaria, with an estimated 300 to 500 million cases per year, most occurring in sub-Saharan Africa, in people that are among the poorest and most defenseless on earth. It's a stunning number. And it's not the only disease spread by mosquitoes. They also spread diseases such as West Nile virus and dengue fever, which to give you a sense for its devastating pathology is also known as break bone fever. Even though mosquitoes have plagued mankind since we came into existence, it has only been since the very late 1800s that we've known they were the carriers or vectors for disease. That insight eventually gave rise to modern professional mosquito control. With a principal mission to protect the health of the public and to do it in a safe, cost-effective, environmentally responsible way. The same principles apply to controlling nuisance mosquitoes what mistaway systems do, and we're going to explore those in the next video.